Welcome to the I Am Interchange Exchange Podcast, where artists, activists, and entrepreneurs with different ideas and perspectives come together and address multiple topics and provoke thoughtful dialogue. Today's topic, Coal Town. There are very few topics that affect each and every one of us without exception. We can try to ignore these issues that we don't see play out in our own homes, or in our own towns, or in our own jobs. But every now and then, there is an issue that ripples out and affects everyone, whether it hits us immediately, or if we only feel the consequences later. Whether you realize it or not, you are part of this episode. According to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, nearly a third of all U.S. energy production comes from coal-fired power plants. So whether you're listening on a computer, a tablet, an MP3 player, or anything else that uses an outlet, you are a consumer of coal-produced power. Behind that power are communities, men and women who work to keep our lights on, our homes heated, and our devices charged. But there are consequences to coal-fired power generation. Coal is widely known to be one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gases and environmental pollutants. Yet, it is essential to our current way of life and our current demand for electricity. Across America and the rest of the world, there are towns that have grown up around and rely upon coal to support themselves, the families that live there, and the electrical grid that makes the rest of our lives keep humming on. So how do we balance our need for energy, our concerns for the future of the environment, and the needs for those communities that live and die by the value of coal? Interchange held a dialogue at the Holter Museum of Art in Helena, Montana, on March 29, 2017, bringing together pro-coal and pro-renewable energy activists, energy industry professionals, policy experts, and the community to talk about the future of coal towns and the people that live and rely upon them. Energy demands, environmental concerns, automation, there's a lot to talk about. Let's let our panel introduce themselves. Good evening, I'm Britt Fontenot, and I am the Economic Development Director for the City of Bozeman. Thank you for coming tonight. I got here because uh, Tate and I developed a relationship uh, several years ago over these controversial topics. And, uh, and uh, as a representative of the City of Bozeman, who um, uh, has been working towards economic diversification in our own community, uh, I was very interested in how I might be able to provide some modest insights um, uh, from, from that perspective on this issue, uh, perhaps some with some takeaways uh, that might be uh, useful. I'm Brent Mead with Montana Policy Institute, uh, and we're a free market think tank, but you know, I worked with Tate on the Standing Rock one, and why I'm here tonight is a little different. Coal is extremely personal to me. I grew up in Sydney, Montana. Um, I just told these guys my first uh, t-ball team, I very much remember, we were sponsored by MBU, which is a coal plant. Uh, and since I've moved to Helen and this is now my new hometown, I mean, I love what coal provides for the state. Holter gets grants from uh, coal, and it's just a lot of what I love about Helena gets a portion of its funding from coal, and it does a lot of that around the state. So that's why I'm here. Um, I'm Lori Shaw with the Coal Strip United Movement. I'm a 25-year-old activist and uh, a resident of Coal Strip, Montana. Um, I started a grassroots movement called Coal Strip United, whose our, our only goal is to inform the public about the importance of coal and coal energy, not just to our little community, but to the entire state of Montana. Um, one thing led to another. It, we've been going for about a year now, and <clears throat> I end up speaking at different events, and I do, I do love it. Um, it is worth it to speak out, so that's why I'm here. My name is Brad Van Wert. I'm a solar electric contractor based out of Bozeman and Billings. And uh, in January, I took on the persona of Solar Guy. And we've done a tour around the state, some web series. Maybe we've showed up in your social feeds from time to time. Um, and what we're doing is we're trying to ensure that the conversation around the development of the solar electric industry in Montana is happening in the public space, uh, specifically net metering, which allows uh, people to install solar, solar electric systems on their home um, and interact with the grid. And I'm here because as a solar contractor, th the coal conversation, whether relevant to the particular setting or not, uh, arises quite often. And so I love to continuously engage, uh, become educated, and help facilitate the conversation. 
I'm Bill Witsett, and one of the other hats that I wear, including uh, having been a former energy executive and uh, care a lot about our energy future, one of the other hats is the chairman of the Greater Montana Foundation. You probably see some of our tags on, on films and, and so forth, but the goal that we have is to encourage communication on issues, trends, and values of importance to this generation and others in Montana. And energy touches all of us. It touches me. Um, I care a lot about the notion that there is no perfect energy source. But this country and this world needs lots and lots of reliable energy. And coal plays, in my view, a very significant and long-term role in that that we can talk about. So um, I'm here out of passion, and uh, I'm glad to be here with this fine group of people. Darren, hi. Rob Arizeri, um, I've been in love with technology since I was eight years old, and my parents kept me up to watch the first moon landing. Um, and I've been working in this stuff my entire life. We consume a lot of energy. We create, um, in some sense, parts of the problem with the massive demand for energy. Um, I'm very interested in sustainable energy and conventional energy. And so Tate and I have known each other for a while. I was on a panel for him before. Um, and I just like wanted to educate myself about the issue and see we technologists own, I feel, we're creating part of the problem, so we own creating the solution too. So that's why I'm here. Uh, Conrad Anker, I'm a professional mountain climber, and um, I practice my craft in high frozen cold places and have seen the effects of a warming climate firsthand. And um, my wife's from Missoula. I came to be with her in 2000, and i um, happy to have Montana as my home, but also for me it's... Um, considering the rest of the world and um, future generations. Uh, Darren Oakcoud, I got here by, by car, not a horse. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a former chairman of the Crow Tribe. Uh, I've been on a panel before on Standing Rock, and this is the second panel. Um, coal, uh, our, our tribe, the Crow Tribe, has, uh, has been mining coal since 1974. It's our um, two-thirds of the general fund budget for the Crow Tribe comes from mining of coal. About the um, largest private employer on the reservation is uh, the coal mine. Um, each tribal member, 14,000, receive uh, royalties and payments from, from the mining of coal. So basically for the last 40 years, uh, it's been our bread and butter as a tribe. And so that's, uh, that's how... I was invited to this event. In abstract, the topic of coal towns affects everyone. But to get to the heart of the issues, we wanted to know what brought our panelists together in the first place. It's a question that we all have to ask ourselves. How does this affect us personally? And what is at stake for each of us in this conversation? Well, I think we all need to recognize that coal is what, in, in largest measure, gives Montana the edges it has in terms of low energy prices, it gives our business, our businesses, whether they're in the Flathead Valley or in southeastern Montana, an edge because of the proximity of the generation that we have and the fact that we're a coal exporter and that we can put electricity into the grid so close to where it's used is a huge advantage. And so we always need to kind of keep that in mind. Also, I would just make one other point. Last year, the coal industry. How does coal affect you? <laughs> I'm part of this society, and I'm part of the, the, the recipient of these uh, prices and reliable energy source. And, and the, the other point I'll make, and all of us need to kind of keep this in mind, last year the coal industry provided in dollars to the states and communities in this, in this state, but the state government and communities, $107 million dollars. And we're talking about maybe that much for infrastructure for the next number of years. So we need to kind of keep things in, in perspective here. Anybody else want to just, we'll, we'll get to the economics of it. Just how does it, how does it affect you personally in your community? I'll go into a little story time mode from my youth. 
Um, one of my closest friends in high school was a kid, Steve. Um, their family was pretty stereotypical Catholic, so Steve had four brothers, four sisters. Uh, his dad worked out at uh, what's now the Bear Paw Station, but it used to be a Coke plant, uh, and his mom worked in HR there. You know, it was a solid middle class job. Steve, all of his brothers and sisters went to college, uh, and their parents were able to afford it. So when I think about coal and all that stuff, it's the value of coal to me isn't um, as a rock that can be turned into fuel. It's what it allows us to do. Uh, and I like a lot of what coal allows us to do. Um, and there are problems. But that, that opportunity that it gave um, one of my closest friends, I mean, that's, that's huge to me. <coughs> Anyone else? Um, how, how it affects me personally is uh, not only me, but um, all, all the tribal members on the reservation. We, we have a, we had an unemployment rate of about 60 percent. Um, I've, I've been in office 16 years, and um, within that time, we got it down to 32 percent unemployment rate. So without without coal, um, that un unemployment rate would skyrocket to maybe 95 percent. No income, zero income. Uh, there's no other source of revenue coming into the tribe. I know a lot of there's a misconception that government pays for everything for the Indian tribes. Not not the case. Um, a lot of our, uh, you know, like I said, our bread and butter comes from mining of coal. So personally, uh, it will it'll affect my tribe and, and my, my family and my people big time. Uh, coal affects me personally because of the nature of what I do for uh, work in renewables um, might lead people to believe that I have a negative view or stance towards it when that's not the case at all. And so what I appreciate about it is it becomes a place to explore, you know, parts of ourselves that we have to be more honest about, whereas, uh, you know, I, I recognize the fact that, yes, I have a renewable energy company, and yet I drive a large truck to run my company. It's And so, therefore, it creates conversations and allows me to have those conversations with people where if they're choosing one or the other, you know, it allows us to explore further some of the ways in our lives that we have to, you know, square out exactly our beliefs and then how we actually live our day-to-day -day lives. Anyone else want to chime in? It's okay. We can. We'll we'll cover it if you if you think of it. Laura, do you want to go? Um, sure. Uh, coal affects me personally personally um, for obvious reasons. Living in a coal town, but um, I grew up in a coal town and got to enjoy the uh, great quality of life, wonderful schools. For such a small town, twenty three hundred, pretty incredible schools. But also, it affects me. It gives me a lot of freedom and freedom in the amazing job that my husband has at the coal mine. Um, when we graduated college in 2013, we were living in Bozeman, and we thought we wanted to live there forever. I still love Bozeman. It's my other great love. Um, we, were just, we both just had bachelor's degrees, and these days it's almost not enough. We were both working very hard and making a pretty low wage. He had an accounting job. I had two jobs. and. When he, when he got a job in Cold Strip, suddenly he was making a wage equal to what we were struggling to make together in Bozeman. And his good job gives me the freedom to do what I do. This episode is supported by Blunderbuss, an artist, activist, and entrepreneur's makerspace in Bozeman, Montana, and is the creative home for I Am Interchange. Montana is an interesting case study in the dynamics of the energy industry, and it highlights the benefits and struggles that other communities face worldwide. All energy production inevitably has to answer for its impact on global climate change, and towns like Coal Strip are no exception. In the United States, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which pulls data from an international pool of scientists and NASA, among others, echo the scientific consensus. The Earth's climate is changing at a rate that will result in a massive cost, both economic and environmental, that are likely to increase over time. Faced with this kind of evidence, is there a way, like the idea of clean coal, to balance our power needs and our environmental worries? 
And how do we reconcile our personal power demands with the fact that they likely contribute to global climate change? Is there a way to bring the two into alignment? Conrad Anker gives us this perspective. Well, we can either ignore it and say it's not happening there, or we can address it and recognize and work on it. The trajectory with carbon in the atmosphere is going up. Um, all of us in this room have experienced change in our lifetime, and the outcome, it's going to be dramatic change regardless of where it goes. But um, the responsibility, I think, for us as a nation, we are 4% of the world's population, and we consume 25% of the world's energy, which is 25% of the world's pollution. And we have the best university system, so it's our responsibility to make this shift from carbon to energy sources that future generations can rely on. I think that's essentially right, but we have to keep a couple of things in mind. Right now, the United States is leading the OECD countries, the developed countries, in reducing carbon. We have the lowest carbon nationally emissions in 25 years. We also see, just in my former field, in the natural gas field, we've seen carbon emissions since 1990 go down 21% and production go up of natural gas 52%. Now, we can always do better, and we need to do better, and we need to uh, continue to see solar and, and wind and these things come online. That's wonderful. But we also need to recognize that while we're making this progress, some of the understanding of what's happening in the climate is only now being peeled back to the point of, of where we're seeing recognition of diverging models and real-time temperatures and all those things. So we just need, I think, to keep an open mind, do the best we can, continue to do better, and uh, hopefully the climate will benefit and our people and those one and a half to three billion people in the world that don't even have electricity, much less the Internet, can find a way to have their lives made better too. So as thought, we hear a lot about clean coal. I mean, where, how do we know? I mean, how, how clean is clean enough? Is, is cleanest in the country clean enough? We, um, uh, Crow Tribe, we, we've been working on a, a study with MSU Bozeman and uh, Little Bighorn College, and it's a full carbon capture uh, where, where we actually capture the whole carbon. Uh, University of North Dakota was also involved, but we would capture the carbon and put them into algae pools, and then the algae pools and the, uh, the carbon mixture we used as fertilizer. Um, there was a three, uh, three year cycle was wheat, wheat, camelina. And then Camelina was then used as uh, uh, biofuels, but that was uh, uh, still using coal. And, and then you had different fuels like uh, propane and uh, different types of uh, fuels that you can make from the, the uh, full carbon capture. And this, a lot of people refer to it as coal to liquids. Um, it's, still, it's still possible, but it's pretty expensive to, to get off the ground. So that's why that technology is there but it's too expensive to, to develop or to move forward, but other countries are starting to look in that direction. Conrad, you and Leonardo DiCaprio push climate change pretty hard. <laughs> and you frequently, he gets the question a lot, I'm sure you do. How do you, how do you settle with yourself jet-setting all over the world and preaching climate change? It is, uh, I'm a target of it. I've got a quarter million people that follow me on social media. I posted on Sunday regarding this, and... I'm, it'll make me stronger, so when I get bullied, I'll answer with it. But yes, we are, we are all complicit in this problem. So once we accept that point, but we have to, one, come to terms with the fact that climate change is real and it's happening. And two, that coal is, by its nature, regardless of its societal impact, with its mercury and sulfur and the CO2 that it puts in the atmosphere, is the most impactful energy source that we can have. So how do we make that transition? All of us in this room are going to live out on as much carbon as we like. It's going to be easy street for us. But if we think 200 years, seven generations down the line, where will we be? I think, uh, you know, an opportunity like we have right here in front of us, but, uh, you know, just in general around the idea of climate change is I think our number one 
challenge right now is reframing the conversation and so that we're looking at it as um, opportunities to empower us as a nation to do better and as opposed to being contentious over our views as whether or not climate change exists or not, what we can do is, you know, around the idea of coal, clean coal, renewable energies, all of them working together or autonomously, you know, I think that some of the great national projects we've seen, like the electrification of America in the first place, switch to fossil fuels, uh, the interstate system, putting men in space, you know, these were all things that everyone could rally around because it flexed our muscle and our strength and our intelligence and our capability. And I think that we should look at this conversation in that framework. Um, I think it'll be, you know, time better spent. Right. So I look at this, it, it's a political and public policy question um, about what sort of costs are we willing to place on ourselves for what benefits? Uh, with the Clean Power Plan, for example, which I think was a lawsuit was filed this morning in Billings on it uh, to re-implement it, which is new. Um, but the per temperature, like the, the estimate from the EPA on how much it will reduce temperatures over 100 years was one one hundredth of one percent. And that carried a cost in Montana, uh, according to the UM, of $1.5 billion in lost economic activity. So to me, that's the question I don't have an answer, is how do we combat this issue in a way that we don't harm our towns or unduly harm them? Because there are going to be winners and losers no matter what policy we take. And it's a matter of deciding what costs are we willing to assume? Who are we willing to harm? For what benefit? And from MPI's point of view, that's why we weighed in against the Clean Power Plan, was we didn't think it was worth the damage we're doing to Coal Strip for this you know, slight uh, decrease in global temperatures. And we acknowledge people disagree with us on that. So. Um, I'm gonna go off of what he said. Uh, there are winners and losers with, with all these decisions for sure, but at some point people really do have to matter in this conversation and when the number of losers start to get really large, you lose support for whatever campaign you are pushing. Um, I can't remember what she said verbatim, but Gina McCarthy said something along the lines of, I wish we would have tried to connect with the rural folks more, but she was, she was still missing the point. Um, you know, the fear, the, the, the fear of not being able to provide for your family will always be greater than the fear of climate change. Always. Not, not knowing if you're going to be able to pay for your kids' food is always going to outweigh climate change. That's just how it is. Can I pick up on that point for just a minute? Um, for those who see periodically the projections by the EIA, I think you mentioned them. Uh, if you look at this chart, which is very recent from the, Envir the uh, Energy Information Administration, and you see the projections out to 2040 for use of coal, which is about flat, and there's also a little, you can't see it out there in the audience, but there's also a little dotted line here, which is a separate line for if we had the clean power plant. And you see the difference in the use of coal in the projections and uh, of the EIA, which I think is recognized as doing pretty good work on this, is minuscule. And to the point that was just made, the problem is that in a state like Montana, where we use a disproportionate amount of coal compared to the rest of the country, the burden of that little difference falls disproportionately in spades on communities like Coal Strip, on our state, and that's why we've got to be, I think, a lot more creative about solutions to climate change and about economics and all of those kinds of things. So, oh so you know, from my perspective, um, there's going to be this cataclysm where, you know, energy sources are going to change. Germany is now, I think, are they at 60 percent through sustainable? It's, it's a large number? No, it's not. We'll get to Germany. Okay. All right. So I'm, so I'm, I'm overhanging the conversation. But I guess you, we're talking about winners and losers. I would encourage us to, like, reframe that conversation of 
don't think about losers. Think about what, what, what would we do in a different scenario to create different kinds of jobs that didn't cause people to be left behind and lose, right? And so create new, you know, new education and Let's new models. Cl Sorry, I'm climate change. In. How far are we willing to go to combat climate change? Change the game. Done with the topic. Let right me now. tell you a story that's very interesting on this point that I, I think I think most people will find interesting. So, two years ago, in conversations that I had with Koreans who talk about their energy future and they import almost all their energy, they were wondering, well, why is it that we can't buy coal from Montana? Why is that? We we have coal demand increase coming. Last year. I was in Japan, in the Fukushima region, and the Japanese were asking the same question. They said, we're 97% reliant. You were at the meeting where this came up recently, and then we had a meeting with Japanese and Koreans in Missoula, or uh, outside of Missoula, recently, and they asked the same question. And their point is that to meet the Japanese, to meet their Paris Agreement, um, I'm going to ignore that for just a minute. <laughs> to meet their Paris Agreement uh, <laughs> targets, they actually have to switch out a number of their old fossil fuel plants. But they don't, they don't have their nuclear back online yet. They have some renewables, and that's growing. But they have to switch out these plants. So they want to go to integrated coal gasification combined cycle plants that have very, very low carbon emissions and almost no other emissions and they want to use Montana coal because that's how they get the efficiency out of the plants. And, you know, this had so many eyes opening at, at this meeting. Um, but it just, it's, it's what you're saying. Think of creative new ways, right, that we can have winners and winners, not winners and losers. Uh, so, again, that's a perfect example in my mind. Imagine this. You live in a small western town whose major industry is reliant on coal. A few hundred of your closest neighbors and friends are about to be out of the job due to the plant closures. This is the reality that the residents of coal strips are facing. Some argue that the plants are closing due to a lawsuit. Others contend that the market forces play a major role. Despite the arguments, the reality is that people are now faced with finding another way of supporting themselves and their families. An entire town is facing the question, how does a coal plant closure affect the very heart and soul of the community that depends upon it? It's pretty devastating to have an economic driver of that size be taken, taken away, not just from our community, but the entire state. Um, it's going to be felt in more than just coal strip, it's like Butte, Great Falls. Um, yeah, so, but I would say that the worst part is that most people don't even understand why two of our power plant units are shutting down in the first place. Most people think that the EPA just swooped in and said, okay, you have to shut down. They don't understand that it was the result of a settlement from a lawsuit brought against our plant owners by the Sierra Club and the MEIC. Um, furthermore, they don't understand that to my knowledge, I'm not, a, I'm not a lawyer, but to my knowledge, the verbiage of that settlement dictates that not only can those units not run past 2022, but they, those boilers can never burn anything again. That means you can't change those to a natural gas plant. They, they, the boilers must be destroyed. Talk about a waste of potential. You can thank the Sierra Club for that. So on, uh, off the top of your head, how many, how many jobs are kind of pending? Uh, I don't know, um, 100 or so. So it's just one group and it's not market forces, it's not market externalities that are doing that, just For one this group. lawsuit, that was two groups, the Sierra Club and the MEIC. And they, if, if they had not filed that lawsuit, it would still be in there? Possibly, Can yes. Can you take into account that in the past 10 years, from 2006 to 2016, Coal, electrical energy generation is down 53%. Natural gas is up 33%, and solar is up 5,000%. Mm -hmm. But in this case, one and two are shutting down because of that lawsuit. Okay. Let's be careful about percentages. Solar is up by whatever percent I'll concede, 5,000. But it still produces less than 1% of the energy in the country. And so we, let's just... Understood by percentage, but when you look at a growth trajectory in business, that's where you want to focus on. Well, that's our next one. I just, I, are you, I just kind of wanted to hear about the soul of kind of the 
building the narrative of you know this is this narrative is going on across the the country. It's not just the towns that you so, said. So what's being done? So it's a hundred jobs. Let's say it's two hundred jobs. What's being done to to and they're very high paying jobs. I hadn't realized mm-hmm. until yesterday yeah, how high paying they are. So jobs. what's being done to like replace those jobs? Given there's an inevitability there, like as Montanans, are we rallying around and figuring out a way to solve that problem? There's a lot of forces in motion right now. Um, gosh, it's hard to even name. A we are actually doing some diversification efforts in Coal Strip. We've been having some meetings with KLJ, um, Southeastern Montana Development, um, sitting there racking our brains thinking of how we could possibly diversify. Hmm. I can tell you the process is still ongoing, but so far we haven't come up with anything that can replace the number of jobs, the hours, or the wages, hmm. but we are trying. Among the voices that often get lost in this discussion, are those of the sovereign tribes that rely upon the mineral wealth of the land to make a living. Tribes like the Crow in Montana depend upon the coal industry for much of their income. And former Crow chief Darren Old Coyote helps us understand their perspective on it. A lot of tribes will say sovereignty, but, uh, but I would uh, refer to it as quasi-sovereign because tribes can, you know, they give you a boot, but they don't give you a bootstrap, you know, the, to, to pull yourself up. Um, everything we do is... Uh, uh, under the U.S. government, that's you know we have our own Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is right in there with Yellowstone Park, Glacier, all the animals. You know the, the tribes are there too. Um, that's what Zinke oversees uh, under Department of Interior. That's who kind of dictates to us on how what, what, what we can or can do. Uh, even our coal leases are approved by the BIA. Even our our leases for farming. You know uh, these farmers that come in and uh, farm lands. Uh, they're you know, those leases are approved. So everything we do is we have to go through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And, you know, Coal Strip, you know, a lot of people are kind of rallying around Coal Strip, you know, because they have that, you know, their, their community, they, they, they have no one else to answer but to themselves. But to us, we, we still have to answer the BIA. And, you know, like the, the Crow Reservation, which was established in 1851 through treaty, was half of Wyoming and half of Montana. And U.S. government said, well, we need this for settlers. And, and they, uh, the first crew agency sits outside of Livingston. Second one is in, uh, right outside of Columbus, and we're at the third agency now. But uh, the Crow tribe, uh, we, um, our reservation was, our western boundary was Missouri River, Three Forks. Southern boundary was Lander, Wyoming. Eastern boundary was Williston, North Dakota. Northern boundary was the Milk River, and from there our land was, you know, from 50 million acres now to two million acres. Um, and a lot of people will say you get everything for free. Our health care isn't free. We are we prepaid our health care. Um, all those lands that were taken from the tribes, and today the two million acres that we do live on, you know, all of our resources were resource rich, cash poor. And the reason why I say that is. We have an abundance of coal. We have an abundance of um, hydro, Yellowtail Dam sits right on our reservation. But even that, who's benefiting from that is the U.S. government. Um, Crow Tribe, they, they, they condemned the river. U.S. government said, we're going to build a dam here. Crow Tribe got made no sense out of it. And so far, the U.S. government has made $600 million off of the, you know, maybe more off of the, the Yellowtail Dam. So when we say quasi-sovereign, we're still at a disadvantage even though, you know, if coal goes away, it's going to be more devastating for, for tribes and, um, you know, for, especially for us. Um, the community that we, that we're close by, Billings, you know, uh, we, each tribal member receives a royalty from the selling of the coal. And a lot of you know, where do these people go? They go to Walmart and, and Billings, or they go to the, to the McDonald's, to the, to the, right into Billings uh, to buy their clothes. Because um, there is no economy on the reservation, because everything we do, we have to go through, or, uh, you know, to the BIA. So that's, you know, a lot of people that live in Montana have this m- misconception that <coughs> tribes are given everything free. And, but, but the governor in the last few years has helped uh, in the economy, you know, um, uh, economic development fund set up for Indian tribes, and that's starting to 
help tribal members to, you know, open up businesses on reservation or off reservation. So it's uh, it's uh, been been a long struggle, but I think we've finally, you know, at the almost to the summit, you know, for for the guy climbing here, the, we're almost to the summit, you know, and but there's still ways to go. Uh, diversification, you know, we got we have potential for wind. We have uh, the grid, you know, we have inf all the infrastructures in place. We have abundance of natural gas, oil, you know, um, all these uh, potential for solar, potential for wind. Um, but, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't see anybody knocking on, on our door to put solar, pan solar panels up or to put in wind farms on a reservation, you know, because, because of that whole different system that's there. What do you think about that, Brad? Um, yeah, I think, and actually we'll be doing a project on uh, Little Bighorn Community College later in the month, so that's exciting. But um, I think be it on the, the tribal lands or, you know, in Coal Strip where we're looking at the loss of um, 200 jobs, you know, I think you're illustrating an important point that, you know, there, maybe there's the loss of these 200 jobs, but where is the real profit going from, from that generation facility? Is it staying in Montana and is it being reinvested in Montana? Sure, the, the hundreds of workers, they live here and they're participating, but there's got to be a larger profit margin coming off of that generation facility. And I think that back to the idea that we're in this antiquated system as far as our grid and how we you know, consume power and now we're up against the wall because of closings and things like that, like how are we going to reimagine our power right now where if it's not essentially located and it's more of a distributed generation network or something like that that not only do the jobs exist here in montana but the profits exist here in montana stay here in montana and benefit of our economy um so kind of a roundabout way of saying that let's make sure that the things that we do moving forward actually have benefits to the tribe to the state technology and <clears throat> business we are a capitalist society. It's how things run. When right now technology transitioned to Oracle, a few people did really well on it, but between three and 500 people lost their jobs wow. in that. But yet at the same time, there was a huge flywheel effect. There's a bunch of startups that um, people that were working there that took that expertise and knowledge and uh, worked on with it. We look at the amount of startups that fail in technology in the... Um, <coughs> in the Silicon Valley area, and it's a constantly building up, shedding jobs, building up, shedding jobs. Um, in the industry that I work within, which is outdoor recreation, clothing, sports equipment, and stuff like that, there's a high churn rate of employees between similar companies, <coughs> between um, similar uh, uh, areas with that. And so the looking forward for Coal Strip is to <coughs> find the way to become the energy capital of Montana. There's a head start because there's coal generation there. And when coal transitions out due to market forces, and hopefully not to externalities, the externalities being lawsuits and um, government um, plans and things like that, but as it transitions, can natural gas be brought in and can there be other jobs that are that are based on this industry that can uh, take up the slack. I just wanted to follow up on, on uh, Conrad's example of the Oracle um, acquisition. You know, one of the, the flywheel effect, as you refer to it, I think is an apt uh, description. Um, one of the reasons it's been successful is because there was an existing infrastructure that was able to support and absorb these, these the formation of these new companies. Uh, and um, and so if, if the infrastructure in my job in Bozeman, infrastructure is how we promote economic development. Um, and so uh, what I'm thinking about in Coal Strip is if we're not repurposing the existing infrastructure for a new use, then we need to th think about um, is, the, is the infrastructure there to support a transformation of the, of the local economy. I just want to clarify because I, I gave um, Conrad some information that I didn't have time to elaborate on. So. There were, there were about 500 people at right now. Um, there are still probably 300 plus, maybe 350. What did happen, and, and I apologize for not, we, we were not 
in a detailed conversation. What did happen is 10 new companies started up, right? You know who they all are. And 15 companies opened or expanded offices in Bozeman to get access to that pool of talent. Right. So there there were there. I would say there's net new job creation. That's why the venture capital fund came here. Will Price and Rich Harges. So that, like there was a net uplift. There's a there's a great post out on the Internet called the Darwinian evolution of startup ecosystems. That's like it started with, you know, Fairchild. Right. Which became Intel, which became Powered Sun, which created, you know. And so that all goes on. And so, there, you know, there's an opportunity there. I'm not sure what it is because I don't know enough about that technology. But we have to figure out a way to get us there. So the cultural issue I see with the debate about what does the future of Coal Strip look like, how do we retrain these workers, is a lot of it comes down to, and I hate to oversimplify like this, but it's a knowledge economy versus a labor economy. And when you tell workers who are labor that to succeed in the future, you have to move to that knowledge economy, what you're doing culturally and psychologically is telling them that you're obsolete. And a story of this that happened in town, um, Fremont, California, used to be home to a very large GM plant. GM shuttered. So then they came in with a solar company, Solyndra. Solyndra went bankrupt due to market forces. The old Solyndra plant is now run by Tesla. But the difference between that old GM labor workforce and the new workforce at the Tesla station, which it's the same plant, is Tesla is very knowledge intensive. It's very automated. And it's not the same workforce. It's not the same people. It might be the same physical location, but culturally it's radically different. And that's an issue we have to address. The basis of that is automation. There is not a single industry in the United States that will be affected by automation. And the, the data on how many jobs in coal are lost to automation is astounding. And that's something that from driverless cars to um, we see it throughout our society. And it's something that we're going to be on the tail end of it in our lives, but it, for future generations, it will. it's a huge cultural shift that's on the horizon. And to plan for it is the, is the right thing to do. Another factor to consider in the future of coal towns is automation. Recent studies suggest that anywhere between 20 and 40% of current jobs will be automated in the next 20 years. Whether or not this will happen is up for debate, but jobs like mining are certainly high on the list to be replaced by machines. With machines hot on the heels of those jobs, our panel expert on artificial intelligence, Rob Irizarry, had this to say. So I spent a lot of time working on this, unfortunately creating this problem, but also thinking about how we solve it. So the, the stats are in the next 30 years, somewhere between 40 and 60 percent of the jobs in America go away to automation. It's, it's shocking and it's very hard to wrap your head around. Um, I was skeptical until I started doing the research. So this thing, you know. It's unfortunate, but it's going to happen, right? People who made buggies when the automobile got introduced, like that was an inevitable thing. Nobody makes buggies anymore, right? And so that shift is coming. It, it has some catac- it's going to have some cataclysmic effects, not just on the U.S. economy, but on the world economy. And so we're going to have to figure out a way like, to get ourselves to adapt to that change. With that on the horizon, Darren and Laurie, what, I mean, what's, is it on the radar? Is it... What, what does everybody think about uh, in your communities? I think for, for us, um, you know, it's not really been on the horizon, uh, not really uh, been thinking about it. Um, for us, um, you know, we've, we've been in, um, I guess, survival mode all our lives. Um, you know, mm. the, the life of the Crow tribe, uh, whether it be through warfare or simulation or you know, diseases, smallpox, uh, you know, we've, we've endured a lot of uh, hardships and we've been assimilated from the life we knew to what, what do we live today. So I think, uh, you know, we will assimilate to whatever, um, you know, comes our way. And we, we've been, we've survived through many, many hardships, many, many obstacles. And, and, and I'm still sitting here today as a member of the Crow tribe that still speak my language. We still practice our culture. We still continue even with changes, you know, um, one of the one of the funny stories uh, my grandma would tell me was that you know uh, many of them 
never knew that there's toilets in the houses. And this one guy, I guess he was well off, he, he had a job, and he said, I, I used the bathroom in my house, and he was kind of frowned upon because by the other uh, members of the tribe. But what he meant was that he installed a toilet and, you know, it flushed, and nobody knew that. And so, you know, it was kind of funny. It, when he, it's funnier when you say it in the Crow language, but, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but that's, you know, the changes were there. Um, and we, we simulated, and you know, like I like I've like I've said, we've survived many many hardships, and I, I know we'll, we'll continue surviving. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> I guess it's not really something we've been thinking about too much. Um, How does it make you feel? About what? Automation. I. Uh, you have to think about something a little bit to feel anything about it, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's, I guess it makes me feel like um, it's definitely worth looking into. And, is, that, yeah. is that enough? What do you think, Rob? I mean, how, how, should we, how, should, how should we feel about automation coming in? Yeah, I, I think, like, it's, it's an, and I don't want to be binary. <laughs> it's, it's terrifying, but it's also, you know, there's some potential there for, like, humanity to be uplifted, right? And when you get ready for the universal basic income part, we'll talk about that. I guess, like, for better or for worse, it's coming. It's, it's like, those numbers are shocking. It's hard. Even as a technologist, it's hard to absorb that, like, even 20% of, like, jobs in America could go away. Because, you know, societally, like, we're going to have a breakdown, right? And it's a problem we're going to have to solve, but it, it's coming. But, but this, I, I think those numbers are shocking, and I do think all of us, everybody needs to be thinking more about this. In the industry I came out of, it wasn't robots like we think about, but it's the efficiencies that technology gains that allowed us to close an office of 500 people in Houston and run everything out of Oklahoma City. I mean, that's technology. You could say, oh, and, and maybe an engineer sitting at a computer in Oklahoma City watching a well in Richland County, mm -hmm. Montana, and watching the squiggles on the seismic lines, you know. I mean, so it's, it's robots and robotics, right. but it's, it's a lot more, right? Yeah, we think about the robot as a yeah. physical thing, but yeah. it's not. So for a good example of this, so recently there was an article, so a chatbot, which is an automated, like basically an artificial intelligence thing that pretends to be a human, contested 250,000 parking tickets in London, and it won 165,000 cases as it learned how to manipulate the system, <laughs> right? And, and we all laugh, but like... The, okay, how many lawyers would have been required for that, right? Can I sign up for that service? <laughs> well, yeah. right. And I'm not picking on lawyers, but, but it's all across. It's project management. It's medical. Like, you know, so the, the base thing there is, like, humans have a finite cognitive space. So you saw IBM ran this project, Watson, right, that beat Jeopardy, beat a human at Jeopardy. Think about what that Two means. Humans. What's that? Two humans. Right. So think about what that means. <laughs> you have, until the board spins up, you don't know what the categories are. You get an answer to which you have to form a question, and then it's a bunch of vernacular. Think about what that took. It took nine years, but now that thing can beat humans, and now they're doing medical research with it and a whole bunch of other applications. Connor? Sorry, go, Connor. So probably everyone in this room has a handheld computer, and probably everyone in this room in the last month said, where would I be without it? Did we use our mapping function to get us here? Yeah. When we were at the supermarket, we're checking out what's going without a person there. So. Artificial intelligence and computers, I mean, we look at the benefit we have from our mobile computers as being this, this, this wonderful attribute. It's making people smarter. It's giving education and knowledge across the globe. It's opened up markets to everyone. So when the majority of us on this panel, over 50, when we were young, it was the newspaper, it was the radio, it was the TV, and to get your word out, you had to pay for advertising. Now... There's this open, egalitarian platform that we're all uh, accessible. This is a different tangent to it, but by embracing that knowledge, that was what created the tech wonder that the United States is. We are the leader in this. We are the most innovative nation. And that same drive and capability is going to lead us in this energy transition because we need to do it. Collectively, not just for the state of Montana, for the United States, but globally, the effects of the, the climate change for coastal areas in the next 50 years 
displacing 150 million people at a cost of over a trillion dollars. And this is so real that Secretary of uh, Defense Mattis listed at the, uh, at the top of the threats to our, our nation's security. Which, you know, like we were saying, you know, or, you know, I was mentioning at the top of the conversation, like great national causes to get behind. And I referenced the interstate system. I mean, the interstate system was built for defense, you know, egress out of major metropolitan areas, you know, moving. And then, you know, but it was presented as this idea of freedom and ability to move about the land of the free and the home of the brave and the beauty. And so that's part of the reframing of the conversation. And, you know, as jobs become automated, we reframe the conversations. What are we going to teach our children to do? Are we going to teach them to, you know, use their time in a different way that's beneficial to the community, even if it's not just hammering nails or whatever? Can I? Yeah, go ahead, Bill, and then I want to okay. get into Let me go back to the energy field, because we talk about reframing conversations. Um, I'm talking with a uh, high-tech startup, relatively startup company in San Diego, who has a business niche to deal with some of the issues we've been talking about, the integration of renewables. And the premise of this new company is that we actually have, in many places at many times, a saturation of renewables, too much intermittent power. So they are using supercomputing, not like in supercomputer, but high-tech computing with algorithms and systems to sell to clients, whether it's a grid operator, whether it's a solar company or a wind farm or whatever, because they can read the system fast enough to get that power on the system first. And if you get it first, and somebody else isn't on making the production tax credits or whatever, then you have a, an advantage. And this is just one little piece of what we're talking about here. The computing, the, the efficiency gains have gotten so great that now, you know, we've, we've got a whole, we have to start thinking of these things differently. Who would have thought saturation of renewable power. We may be at that point in parts of Montana at different times. Negative pricing, where renewable energy companies are having to pay in Texas and California to get on the grid because it's cheaper than avoiding the, or not getting the tax credit, which is phasing out, but still, it's a, it's, and so we have to ask ourselves, how sustainable is that business model? Yeah. And who's gonna come up with the technologies to try to work right. all that out? I Am Interchange is supported by listeners like you. If you'd like to make a social investment, visit our Patreon page, www.patreon.com forward slash I Am Interchange. That's I A M Interchange. Whatever the future brings, there are real people right now who feel the effects of our energy demands. Both those who watch our most fragile parts of our planet and those who rely on the coal industry to provide for them and their families. With everything that we know, where do they think that a place like Coal Strip, the reservations, and the world will be in 20 years? I'd like to share my optimistic version of Coal Great, Strip. Yeah, Good. please. Good. Um, I, believe that there, I believe that clean coal is the future, and I believe that there is a future for coal in Coal Strip. So... <clears throat> 20 years in the future, units five and six will be up and running. <laughs> and there will still be um, good paying full jobs in Coal Street. Okay. Mm. Darren, how about you? Where, what's your vision of the Crow Tribe in 20 years? With I, guess all? I, I guess I would have that same up, up, optimism. Um, uh, right now, China and uh, you know the Asian market is uh, looking for, for coal, and we've been dealing with uh, export terminals, and I think the future is uh, we will be shipping coal to to China. And and right now, a lot of technology we're doing, we're saying it costs us too much. But in China, the same technology that we're talking about, where they're you know capturing the carbon um, with zero emissions, you know, the, the, all these other countries are doing it. The U.S. is the only one that's you know we we. We're our own worst enemy. We we put too much regulations on, you know, different uh, different aspects of our lives, and you know we're, we're we're our own worst enemy. So I think that's why a lot of these uh, the flexibility of these other countries are starting to advance um, in energy development, and we're still you know trying to catch up and trying to save the earth. But you know the other countries are, are looking at ways to to save the earth as well. 
because if we, no, ma no matter what we do, how much pollution we pollute or we don't pollute, you know, there's another country like India that's polluting just as, just as much or even more. China's polluting even more. Um, so it's, I think it's uh, not only U.S., I think it's a global uh, issue that we all have to work uh, together on. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is for Britt, Brent, and Brad. What's your vision of Montana in the next 20 years as these factors play out? I'm optimistic as well uh, about the state. I, I, you know, I, uh, um, when I look around, uh, I, I look at uh, the communities that are innovating in, in all kinds of different ways um, because they have to. Um, the Montana economy is changing, and, um, and I think so is the global economy for that matter. And uh, the more we're willing to uh, acknowledge that and, and face that and offer some alternatives uh, and, some, and compromise in some very important ways that are not uh, detrimental to either, but, uh, and work together, most importantly. And recognize that this is not just coal strips problem. It's not just in the timber side. It's not just you know, Libby's problem or, or some other community's problem of the day. Uh, we, as a state of Montana, I think it's our obligation. It's not just the tribal problem. Um, it's our obligation to rally around our, um, you know, our communities and, uh, and do what we can to offer as much support um, and ins ins inspiration to innovate and, uh, and, help, uh, and help out as, as best we can. So I'm optimistic, and, um, and I hope you are too. Brent? I'm an optimist, but I will share my concerns of what it takes to get to that optimistic vision. Uh, in eastern Montana and in Coal Strip, I mean, there's a culture. I was an Eastern A kid. Like, there is a culture in eastern Montana. To If there is change that is going to come to these communities, it has to come from within. It can't be the situation where the future of these towns is dictated by a lawsuit from a group that doesn't spend any time, that doesn't have a plan to replace that uh, school revenue, that doesn't have a plan to save the Rosebud Hospital. It has to come from within. It has to be on their terms. If we can't get there, uh, you're going to see some real stark divisions in the state. Uh, and I don't think it's going to be good politically or culturally because I like to think Montanans, um, you know, it's... One big town, one main street. You know, we all know each other. It's instead of however many degrees Kevin Bacon, it's two. Um, the other thing we have to do, there is precisely one demographic in Montana that we lose to other states through net uh, immigration. And that's people 21 to 29. Mm -hmm. That has to change. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot have people when they first start their careers, we cannot have them leave Montana. And some of that is, not all these kids are high knowledge kids. You know, some of them are trade skills, some of it is labor skills, and we have to do a better job of finding a place for them in Montana. Um, ultimately, I'm optimistic that we'll get that done, um, but it's hard. It's gonna be hard. I mean, it's, it's gonna be a fight and there's gonna be a lot of um, conflict in the state over it. Go ahead, Brad. Uh, well, I'm a hopelessly optimistic person, as it is. Um, and so I just, you know, I feel fortunate that I've spent the better part of the last 20 years building my life here. And I've seen the potential um, of just the way Montanans think. And so I think as our state grows, I think that the opportunity is, again, with, with a currently low kind of population number right now, but growing, and then a large state with... An abundance of natural resources I think we have the ability to pivot quickly and you know adapt but also develop and you know in my particular industry I see a lot of opportunity in solar because I see a lot of growth there and I think that we can develop the industry here in the state responsibly because it is still small and if we do that amongst Montanans we can keep the profits here in our state and then ultimately benefit the economy as a whole thank you um, so we're going to scope out one more. Um, Conrad, Rob, and Bill, what's your vision of the world as these factors play out in the next 20 years? Bill? Bill. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'm optimistic in most senses. But let me focus just on energy because, I mean, the state of the world, I can't do that in a minute. Um, but on energy... Clearly, we're going to see continued evolution. We're going to see more renewables. There's no question about that. We're going to see 
things that make sense producing more energy, but we're also going to have much more energy demand. I mentioned the one and a half to three billion people that don't have energy or electricity at all. That has to be served. Uh, they, they are aspiring, but in uh, Asia in particular, I think Darren mentioned it, the demand for coal is going to continue to grow and Montana can play a role in that. I think it will eventually. We're going to get infrastructure issues solved and we're going to be exporting coal. And that actually, with these new turbines that we're talking about, one of which I'm going to hook the Japanese up for you guys in coal strip, um, <laughs> are really going to make things better than they are today and coal will have that role. And so I think where I'm, I'm pessimistic is how do we get the people in the world that haven't had the benefit of coal and these other fuels to raise their standard of living? How do they, we get them beyond a subsistence level of living and bring them up? And how is that paid for? 3,200 new power plants in Africa are needed today. And the, the lowest cost estimate is like 157 billion for the most simple technologies. Um, so how do we, how do we as a society, as a world, cope with those things. Thanks. Rob? Conrad? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, 20 years from now, we'll probably have a global CO2 at 425 parts per million. We'll probably be growing corn instead of wheat. There will be some pretty dramatic changes um, on our planet that are a result of climate change. Um, it's a real, it's not a manufactured crisis. Um, Bill, regarding your bringing energy, the, the quality of life to the 1.5 billion people that don't have it in this world, the planet cannot sustain the energy consumption that we in North America have. By It's just not possible. The per capita energy consumption in India and Africa is much lower than what it is. So the way that they're going to get that is that we share it. We can either share it by giving away our wealth, we can also share it by creating technology and innovation that allows them to be with that. Um, we had the second warmest February on record. We've got a couple more days left in March. It'll be the warmest March on record. And there's extensive coral bleaching that is occurring on the Great Barrier Reef in off the east coast of Australia. All indicators of how things are changing. The prognosis of what the people have put out there is not that it hasn't come true, that it's come to pass faster than expected. Rob? So I guess on the, on the energy, I'll, I'll give you one energy stat, so where, where I think technology can help us with this problem. So there was an article last July, um, Google put its artificial intelligence called DeepMind on its data center power problem. So they used Four million megawatt hours, 4.4 million megawatt hours of electricity in 2014 just powering servers. They were able, by using the artificial intelligence to control the fans and the cooling, they were able to get a 15% reduction in overall power consumption. That's huge. So if we take technology and we think about like how do we, how do we think about these alternative energy sources? Could we burn coal much cleaner? I don't know. Like I don't know about that, but we have a bunch of smart people and we have a bunch of computers that could help us with that problem. So I, I think we have to we have to think differently, and you know we have to solve this problem, right? Because we can't let what's happening happen. Um, and I think we just all have to get together and you know. Take, the, take what you guys have, which is like deep work ethic and, and care for the earth, and, you know, figure it out. T not to oversimplify it, but like we don't have a choice. With that, we draw this episode to a close and encourage you to comment on our page and start a dialogue in your community. Remember, share airtime and don't ruin dinner. This episode was produced by Dylan Jesse, Tyson Lund, Susan Carstensen, and me, Tate Chamberlain. Music by Nintendo and the Buddha. Our sound was provided by Loken Productions. Our panelists were Brent Mead, Conrad Anker, Lori Shaw, Bill Whitsitt, Rob Irizarry, Darren Old Coyote, Britt Fontenot, and Brad Van Wert. This episode was supported by Ten Directions, the Holter Museum of Art, Taco Del Sol, the City of Bozeman, the Dive Bakery, Tactic, 
Whole Strip United, Hatch, Headframe Spirits, Wonderbus, Nora Sachs, Jessica Cena, Tom Egelhoff, Sarah Frazier, Jory Appadale, Ruth Levine, Cole Jansen, Sarah Farnsworth, Kaido Irizarry, Ben Johnson, Nakai Talent Hollowhorn, and Jen Spencer. A special thanks to our board of directors, Debbie Shank, D. Gregory Smith, Kia Abbey, Chris Gentry, Chad Yurishak, Yaro Craner, Jacob Desch, Justin Wayne, Dylan Jesse, Jessica Byerly, and Tate Chamberlain. Do you have an issue that's riddled by gridlock in your community? Contact us at iaminterchange.org. That's iaminterchange.org. We ran out of time on this episode, but stay tuned for an upcoming short on universal basic income with Rob Irizarry, and for our upcoming episode on human migration and displacement.